Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at what it takes to actually make an activity with our Android application that can both use a sound and video, as well as looking at what it takes to use the idea of a runnable thread. So we can use that for some uh, small animations within our project. So we've got right here our project put together already. So we're going to take a look at that. We've got a standard Android activity project. We have two activities in the project itself, a sound activity and a video activity. And we have layouts for each of those. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at the layout for them really fast to get that going. And then we'll go look at the actual code for it after that. So first we're going to start off with the sound activity XML. And again, that's our layout activity that we use for that. As you can see right here, we have a few features. We have a seek bar, a play, pause, stop button, as well as a button to go see the video. We have those that specified right here with names on that so they can clearly have a name rather than button one, two, three. So we can take care of that. They're aligned with a uh, pretty standard approach where we have play, pause, and stop set for that. We have our seek bar right here, which we're gonna use to actually keep track of where we are within the sound. And we have that aligned against the top and our button right there. We take a look at the actual text for this. And we have our standard header for that for the relative layout. We have a seek bar, has an idea of seek bar with the set to match the parent and we have a margin against the top. We have our play, pause, and stop buttons and we have them lay out against that so they're all lined together with that with the text attached to this. We have that specified as you can see right there inside our strings.xml file so we can actually refer to that properly so we don't have a warning saying we're using a static string on this. This will allow us to actually if we were to internationalize our application, we can make it so the strings will update accordingly to the various different languages. A better way to actually write our code. And we have that for each of the buttons as well. All of them are on there right that way. Nice little smiley face for our see the video button as well. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at our XML for our video screen. As you can see our video screen, we have a button to go back to the sound or our main page and the video view itself. Taking a look at the actual code that goes along with that, we have a very, very small actual uh, file here for the XML, simply the video view object and our button object. Again, referring to that, if you notice that our video view object does not have a lot of code attached to it on the XML side, it simply specifies that it's going to match the parent and wrap the content of the thing. We could do a specific height or something attached to this, but for right now we're simply using those default values for that. And so we've got our XML files that we've got for this to take a look at it. We have a couple files over here in a raw folder. The raw folder is necessary for us to actually use any pre-compiled things such as sound, video, or XML files that are not related to the actual Android file. The standard approach of all everything in our res folder still applies though. We need to make sure that all of our files have no capital letters and of course that we have no spaces. So we have party.mp4 which is a video file and poem to terror mp3, a recent um, music file that we'll be listening to as part of the application. So we've got those, we're going to close those raw folder down. And again, just to add that feature, if we want to add that into it, we simply just right click on our res folder and we'd go over here on that, do new and make a new directory is all we have to do to make that res folder, um, the raw folder inside our res folder exist if we hadn't already done so. But we're going to go ahead and close our layout folder out as well. And let's go take a look at the actual code for this. Again, we're going to start with our soundactivity.java. That's the main screen for this. And we have our standard set of import statements up here. Uh, with our activity, intent, etc. We have a couple things that belong specifically to this app, which would be for the media player and for intent that we'll be using for uh, dealing with the switching screens and for playing the sound. We have our um, widget.asterisk, again, because we're using a couple buttons in there as well as the sound seek bar. So we want to make sure we have that available so we can actually import the values for that. In our header for our class, we have our public class sound activity extends activity, which is quite standard for what we've been doing. However, we're adding a new feature to this, which is the idea of implements runnable. Implements, again, is the use of the Java interface. And so it means we're going to have to do whatever runnable has, any methods that are inside the runnable interface, we have to implement in our own code. And we'll be taking a look at that in just a moment. But this allows us to do specifically things, in this case, dealing with a thread, so we can actually have the ability to have things happen on the fly within our code. And so we'll deal with that in just a bit. We have our declaration section. As you can see right here, we declare a few buttons, as well as our media player, our seek bar, and a thread, which is our sound thread, which we're going to be using as part of the actual animation sequence of that seek bars uh, deal. We have our onCreate, as always. Our first two lines, of course, with a super.onCreate as the first line of the method, and finally set content view, where we're assigning the view for this specific layout, so we attach it to our XML for that. Then we have our initialization of all of our widget values. So we have our buttons, seek bar, button, and media player. Notice that on our media player that we're doing something a little bit different. We're using the static method dot create because we don't need to make a new media player instance and it's not actually finding it from a view, but we'd rather call media player dot create and we pass it the context of our actual application. And then we pass it the 
path for the file going r.raw and the name of the sound file that is located inside our res folder. We have our setup listeners method, which we'll use to deal with our listeners as always, which we'll hit that in just a second. And then after with our listeners, we also have the fact that we're going to say sound thread as a new thread, passing it this. We are able to pass it this because this implements runnable, so it's a runnable object. And then we call soundthread.start, which starts that thread, so it will actually be available to us inside the application. So we'll go take a look at this and see what happens to go with that. We have our setup listeners method, which we've used quite a few times. And we have our start button. It's a new view to onclick listener, just like always. And inside that, we have our add override and our public void onclick, passing it view v. Since they're not doing anything with the actual view itself, I just gave it a default name on that. And I call soundplayer.start. So the play button, or start button, will start the sound. We have the same approach right here for our pause button that's set on click listener. Again, you can see it's view v. We've collapsed the code right here, but it simply calls soundplayer.pause. So if I expand this out so we can take a look at it. Again, the same thing, public void on click. That on click method is required because this listener that we are creating, this new view to on click listener, that anonymous object, implements the on click listener interface, which requires us to have this method. So we've addressed the idea of an interface already right here inside our code, but now we're going to see it in a more detailed fashion with the use of the thread or runnable interface. And in our stop button, we have actually a little bit more code that we want to take a look at. So let's take, expand that out and pull this up to the top of the screen. So we want to take a look at the stop button. Uh, again, we have the idea that we are going to have um, that center uh, new view to onclick listener we've been using. That's the uh, implementation of an anonymous class that implements that interface. And inside that onclick method that we have that's required for the interface, we have in here, we have the soundplayer.stop, which is uh, pretty easy. It's just the dot stop method, which stops the, um, stops the actual sound from playing. But what we have to do when we stop the uh, sound player, it also releases the audio file from the sound player itself. And so because it's released then from the memory, we have to reload it as part of that. So as part of our stop method, what we're going to do is also right here, we're going to call mediaplayer.create, which is going to reinitialize that sound, attach it to the sound player again. And then we're going to call get base context, which is part of the actual application, which gets the context of the application as a whole. And then we pass it again, that same sound file again of r.raw.palm to tear. So we have access to our sound file. Now we have our uh, video button. Pull that up and expand that out. And with that, we're using our standard approach of using the uh, couple lines to get to the new screen. And so we have intent, my intent, and we're going to create the current view get context, which is that button view that we've uh, attached to that actual button itself, and the name of the other class we're going to be going to. And we saw, uh, call start activity for result, pass it my intent and zero, because again, we're expecting that to be the correct value for that to come back as a zero, as we're seeing for standard for that. We also have our sound seekbar dot set on seekbar change listener. Um, that we're creating. So that's an implementation of the on bar change listener interface. And that one has a bunch of methods. We're going to take a look at that. And as you can see inside this one, we have nothing inside the on stop tracking or in the on start tracking methods. They are completely emptied out. We're not using anything inside them. They're just uh, stub methods that are required because of that interface. But we don't have anything in them. So it's simply an open and closed squiggle. However, the method we are going to be using is the public void on progress change method. It has as a parameter a seek bar, a progress, and a boolean from user. And so is it the user's response that's actually causing that seek bar to change, or is it coming from non-user, aka the program itself? And so we have that if it is from the user, and since it is a boolean variable, simply putting that inside there, so if it returns true, it goes inside that if test. And so if, if it is from the user, we'll call soundplayer.seek to and pass it that progress variable, which is how far it's gone on that. So it make, it'll make it so it'll seek to that point of the actual sound file. So this is something that's a bit new right here. So again, we're using the on seek bar change listener, which has more methods than simply on click. So it has the stop and start tracking that we did nothing with. So we, for the stub method, we literally put them an open and closed squiggle, which means it's completely empty. It does nothing at all if I try and stop tracking or start tracking it. We're not doing anything with the touch. Only thing we're doing with the touch is when we change the progress of the actual seek bar itself. And then we have down here, we have the idea since we're implementing runnable, the class itself must have a method called public void run. So that is the one method as part of the runnable interface. And so we have this expansion right here. And this is where we're actually going to deal with the idea of having our seek bar update automatically when we play the sound. So this is a really nice cool little animation we can do. And so we have our public void run. And inside that run, we have a current position variable. It starts off at zero because we're going to keep track of that. We have our sound total, which is the get duration of the sound file. So we want to find out how long our sound is and store that inside a total variable. And we have our sound seek bar dot set max. So we're going to set what is the maximum possible value of that sound file. 
And so then we have a loop right here. We're gonna use a while loop for this. And as long as the sound player is not equal to null, again, we have to make sure it's not null before we test anything else. And then we check to make sure that the current position is less than the total. We wanna make sure that our thumb bar is before the end of the screen. And we're gonna do a try. Standard try right there where the code we know compiles, but we're not sure if it's gonna execute properly. And so in this case, we're gonna use what's called thread.sleep. So as you can see, this is a static method because we're referring to simply the instance threat, or not, excuse me. As you can see, this is a static method because instead of referring to an instance of a thread, we're calling just the stat, the method sleep on the thread class. So thread.sleep and we're passing the parameter of 300. Now thread.sleep uses a parameter of milliseconds, so 300 milliseconds is about a third of a second. So it's very, fairly quick. And then we'll set, after it's wait for a third of a second, we're gonna say that, um, the sound player dot get current positions. We're gonna grab the current position of the sound player where it is the sound itself, what's been playing, and we'll assign that, vari that value, excuse me, to the variable current position. Our catch that we have for this, we have an interrupted exception, sound exception. All I do is return out of that. I, ju I just leave the method, I don't do anything. Same thing with my catch in general exception. I simply return right outside of that completely. So I have two exceptions I'm catching. One for specifically I've interrupted something caused my app to be stopped. But I, if that's the case, I simply just dump out of the method. And if there's any other possible exception that possibly could be thrown, I do that same approach. I simply just dump out of the method. And finally, after that, um, try is executed and the catches have done, I automatically have my set uh, progress, so I move the thumb bar of the, uh, the seek bar to that new value of current position, which we had attached to here, or if, it, um, if that was not successful, it would stay the same. And so that's a while loop, so I'll keep repeating as long as the sound player is not null and the current position is less than the sound hole, so we'll keep repeating over and over again until my sound is finished playing and then it stops. And so we have that while right here, we have the end of the uh, method right there and the end of our class. So we have inside that, we have the idea that we're going to have this run until that point. So we're gonna go ahead and hit play on our app, have it load up here. We have the seek bar with the blue glowing circle following that line that goes from the start to the end. Our three buttons for play, pause, and stop so we can actually see what's happening. And we have our see the video button that we'll use to get track of, um, to switch to the other screen so we can look at the idea of doing the video as well. And so we're gonna go ahead and hit the play button and we're gonna see, um, we will see the progress of the seek bar as it goes along the screen matching the progress of the song itself. The pause button will have the indicator for the position the song freeze at that point and the song freeze as well. Whereas the stop button will reset both the song and the seek bar to the very beginning. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll hit play. And as you can hear, we have the song itself playing right now. and the song itself is playing, we can see the fact that also the indicator of our position is moving right here and going along with it. If I click on the indicator and scroll it up to the front, you can hear that the sound is seeking. And so you can hear that little scrub sound as it moves back and forth along the sound file automatically because we're using the indicator on it. If I hit the pause button, both the song and the indicator will pause. And it'll simply wait until we have further input from us. If I move it back again, you'll hear the no sound because it's not currently playing. But then if I hit play, it starts immediately from that position and pause. Again, it stops at that point. The sound is no longer playing. If I scrub back and forth, we don't hear the song scrubbing because we've paused the um, sound play. If I hit the stop button, it resets the indicator and the song both to the very beginning. I hit play and we'll hear the low um, beginning. And it continues to play the song again, moving our indicator up along with that. So again, take a look at the code that goes along with that. And so we'll see this as we're watching it right here, move this to the side. And so on our play button, we have the sound player dot start that is linked to that. So when I hit play, it'll start. So if I hit play again, there is no impact because it has already started. However, if I hit pause, the sound itself stops because we called the dot pause method on that player object. I hit play again and we'll restart it from that position where it was already marked. I hit pause again and use the scrub feature and hit play. It moves to that appropriate song because we move down here to our seek bar listener 
and we have that on progress change method that we were looking at earlier. And because the from user is true, because we're the ones who did that, we then move our sound player, we, have, we call the seek to method, which adjusts the song to that new progress position. So it moves the progress of the progress change, so it moves the seek bar itself to that spot, and moves the sound player to its corresponding location on the actual song itself. Then because of the fact that we have the runnable interface implemented, with this run method that we are requiring right here, we have the idea that as long as every 300 milliseconds occurs, we update our song's position on the seek bar by that much. So if we take a look at our screen right here, and hit play again, as the song plays, here's the cursor indicating where it starts off, every 300 milliseconds, we have a corresponding move between the position of the song and the song indicator right there. So as you can see, because this is a fairly long song, it takes a, quite a bit for that to move a fair distance. If we were to use, if we were to use a very short song, say for example one that's only five seconds long, that progress would go very, very fast. And so the idea on that is we can actually see that duration, it can match up based on the percentage of the, of the song as a whole. If this was a short song, it'd still be this indicator the indicator would still be this big, but the jump on the indicator would be correspondingly larger. Our stop button again, because I hit stop, it resets it, which of course would set the position then to the, my current position would go to zero, so it moves it automatically to that spot. We move back up here to our actual seek bar changed. We told it to, that wasn't a seek bar listener, so it doesn't worry about that, but we have the idea right here of our video, <clears throat> right here of our stop button, which stops the sound, which comes back to our run, which says, oh, my position is at that position right there, so it's gonna set my max to that sound total, and it's gonna go ahead, and it's my current position is at zero, so it moves it back down there. And it then resets the sound player to go to that new dot create method, casting the base context and the sound that we have already loaded into it. So we have the idea right here that this stop button will have it, so it stops the sound, reloads it as needed, and then automatically we have that runnable method right here, the run, which is required for that runnable interface. So it automatically moves it, so it updates automatically every 300 milliseconds throughout the song. We hit the see video button, again, just like normal, that'll have it swatch to the other screen. Standard right here where it creates that new intent and loads that other screen by calling the dot class of the other object and moves us clearly to our other screen. Now with a video activity, it's a little bit different. If we take a look at our code for our video activity.java, we have our um, public class right here. Imports, we'll take a look at that as well. And we have our imports right here. Standard set of imports where we have the view, the widget. We have a one new one with this and the idea of the .net.uri for the uniform resource indicator so we can actually deal with a path of a file. We have our video view object, our button. In the case of a video file, instead of using a sound player, we use what's called a media controller. And there's our URI, our Uniform Resource Indicator, and we call that video location because it reflects again what it is and what it does. It locates the video for us. Inside the onCreate for this other activity, again, we have our standard approach where we call super to onCreate as our first line of code as required for activity. Then we set the content view to the, match the corresponding XML layout. We initialize our two variables of our my player and our return button. So we deal with these two values of the media player and the return button just by using the standard find view by ID method that we use for everything else on Android development. Now, for dealing with our video location, however, we have to actually build a spot for it, tell it where to find the information. And so we say our video location's a uri.parse. So we're gonna call the static method on uri, which is the parse method, which is gonna put together a location for it, which in this case is a URI object, and we're going to call pass it android.resource colon whack whack, which forces it to look inside the actual application for it, and then we're going to call the get package name method that returns the package of our project, which we could um, see right up here of ctech.soundandvideo.controller, but we um, call it method internally in case this were to be moved into some other project, we don't have to specify what I've put inside mine, and then we add a forward slash on that with quotes, again using the standard string concatenation of a plus operator. And then we also add to it r.raw.party, which as we saw inside our structure of our project, in our res slash raw folder, we had our party.mp4, which is the file. And again, notice that we are calling it party, and we do not reference the .mp4, just as we do not reference the .mp3 file, then we're dealing with the sound location. And so r.raw.party, and then we say that our video controller is a new media controller passing it this. 
So this is referring to this activity. And so that's a way that the, we are attaching the media controller is referring to the activity itself. That's, it requires an activity as a parameter for that. We then have our prepare the media video method in our setup media. We take a look at our setup media method and we set our media controller to the my video controller. So we're having the idea that we are referencing our existing me, um, video controller that we just defined up here that belongs to the object itself. And we set our URI for that video player, passing it video location. The information again that we passed from right here. So we're having the idea that we are building the references for that and attaching it to the media player right here. For this, we also have to create some listeners for the button. We only have to create a listener for the video view. All the handling of the video, because we're using that media player, is handled internally by Android. So we don't have to worry about having a play, pause, stop, or fast forward features. All that information is handled directly by the media player for this case. So we don't have to worry about any of the features that we just used on the sound file. All we have to do is have our button that will take us back to the original screen and close the screen by calling finish, which we've been using throughout the other projects already this year. So let's go ahead and take a look at the application again itself. And when I hit when I click on this area that I'm dealing with the actual video file, it brings up the idea that we have a play, pause, fast forward, and rewind. And we have a seek bar right here that tells us we have access to the video. It starts off at 00 and goes to 17 seconds. So it's a very short little video. If I had to seek um, halfway through this over at about six seconds, so we can see a clear difference right here, I move that and hit play, and the video will automatically load up to that position and go there. The video by default will play until the end, and then stop. And I click on it again. I can scroll back to any point and I can seek along the entire video, forcing myself to scrub the entire video watching where it's happening. I can use the rewind, which will take us all the way to the end, the fast forward, which takes us all the way to that side, or takes us in chunks as well. And all this um, handling of the video itself is internal to that video controller that we created right here by creating a new media controller and passing it that video object. So because we have attached that media controller, all the handling of the user input for this, dealing with the seek, um, dealing with the starting of a specific position, all the handling of the video and matching it according to that is handled internally by Android. We don't have to write the code for that ourselves as we did in the sound seek activity. So we'll go back to the sound um, activity again, brings us back to the main menu. Again, it automatically resets it so that we have our sound at that position. We're right here, we can go ahead and hit play. Our sound works just like it did earlier. We can hit pause, works just the same again. So again, taking a look at what we've done, we have our video activity where we have a video view which handles all of the um, user input that we don't have to handle um, our own like we did with a sound bar. We have our button which we use just normally. The media controller right here uh, combined with the video view take care of all the, the video display and user input that we handled on our own with our sound side. The standard initialization of the video view happens inside the onCreate. We just have to have the setup media method that we create for this on our own, where we attach the media controller for that player, and we attach the video location for the player as well. Our listeners, all we have to do is just get us to go back to home, so we don't do anything special on that one. We go back to our soundactivity.java. Our soundactivity.java, we added that new feature. We use the uh, specific implementation of an interface. In this case, we use the runnable interface. Because we're using the runnable interface, we have to add a method called run. It is a public and void method. And this is where we allow ourselves to have the um, animation of our seek bar happen. So every 300 milliseconds, that will um, move itself up automatically. If we were to shrink that down to a very small number, it would, take, it would go even less, it would move even tinier bits each time. If I take it to 3000, it would go only every three seconds would it adjust. And so we'd see a choppier chop, chop, chop on our actual sequence. So that we have that idea that we can control how often the animation happens by using that thread.sleep. We have our standard approach of using our button listener to move to the other screen. We added the idea of having a play, pause, and stop button for the sound listener. So the sound player dot start, dot pause, and dot stop. Because we hit stop, we have to remember to reinitialize our media player because it loses the reference to it. And then when we deal with the seek bar, we had three methods are required to be implemented as part of the its interface, the on stop tracking, on start tracking, and the on progress changed. The only one we actually put code into, however, was the on progress changed. We left the other two as completely empty because we're not adding anything to it. 
And on that one, to make sure it's only from the user so we can handle that input, we added an if test on that, passing it the from user variable, which is part of the parameter sequence for that method. And if it is from the user, we'll adjust the sound player to that new position. Thanks again for watching the video and have a great day.